then we're talking about a complete identification of our being with the divine source that's at the origin of it all. I don't like using the word God, and I do not like using the word spirit. Why? Not that I'm against God, which would be a rather defeatist attitude. Someone asked Abraham Lincoln one time in the Civil War, he said, she, he said to the president, God is on our side. And Lincoln said, I, I, I'm not sure whether he is or not, sir, but I sure as heck hope that we are on his side. So when we're talking about God, you know, we're, we're thinking of him as a person, as a human being. And that's why until you get past that, you can't really discuss anything about God with anybody. In, in my opinion, the word God, because of its associations with that superhuman human who's up there with the beard, the clouds, and the book of life, and the computer, and the laser science, he is what I think of when someone tells me you are God. And I know I'm not sitting on a cloud with a long beard. Therefore, I find it hard to absorb this fact. Ranthus' teaching, where he uses the word point zero, I find is much better, because from my, to my mind, the word God is beyond rehabilitation, and so is the word spirit, because it's become burdened with so much irrelevant and erroneous baggage from the past that we'd be much better served to drop the word and use another term that does not have that history tied to it. In the film, you said something to the effect of, you know, we're, we're far too hung up on morality and good and bad. And I know a lot of people have said, well, what does that mean? Do you abandon, you know, any sense of, you know, being righteous or virtuous, you know, any of those ideas? So why, why is it important then to, to abandon an idea of morality in order to um, have a more evolved perspective? Well, I haven't had the advantage of seeing the movie 50 times like some people here have, unfortunately. That's nothing to do with anyone's fault except my own. But I think I did say in the movie that there is no right and wrong. Does that mean that it's a free for all? Absolutely not. I mean, the problem that I have with right and wrong in those categories is not that I want a free for all, but that right and wrong doesn't go nearly far enough. I also have a problem with words like miracle. I mean, is levitation a miracle? Is walking on water a miracle? Is the multiplication of reality? in your hand a miracle, or is becoming invisible a miracle? N-O is the answer. They are not miracles. They're simply availing of higher forms of physics, which we do not yet know. In certain religions, if you levitate, you can become canonized. Of course, the catch is that you've got to die first. However, they never canonize anyone until they're safely dead in case they kick over the traces subsequently. But I am not against right and wrong in itself. I'm simply saying that, like the word miracle, it's too poverty-stricken a term to capture the grandeur of what's actually involved. Because a miracle suggests something that has been bestowed from above by a benign God who's pleased with your progress. So you get a reward. You levitate because God's pleased with you. You levitate scientifically because you have exerted a torsion field which runs counter to gravity. And if it's strong enough, it will allow you to float. There's nothing mysterious or miraculous about it. It's far more wonderful than any miracle. Likewise, with right and wrong, you know, they don't go far enough. Because all that says is that I am guiding my life by a set of rules given from above by this creature, God, because he is a creature on a cloud. So what am I replacing that with? I'm replacing it with a far more enlightened understanding by which we might guide human behavior, which is far more exacting and demanding than a system of right and wrong could ever be. Because what am I saying is that there are actions that evolve me and there are actions that regress me. In other words, if you just, just use Newtonian physics to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if I do something, I know in the structure of the universe that I'm in that the effects of that are going to come back to me and that I must one day, whenever it is, sooner or later, I must deal with it. So that's what I want to suggest as a criterion for behavior, not this crude right and wrong obeying rules of some superintending deity in the clouds with a, la a, la a lazy satellite system to see the number plates on your car. No, I want 
you to understand that in the whole course of evolution that we're involved here, when we were advancing into it with the use of quantum insights into nature, that everything I do, I must answer for. It's all going to come back to me. And therefore, I have to be very, very careful what I do. Far more careful than right and wrong. Because as you know, the whole system of right and wrong has just been construed as a barrier to protect me from God making too many demands. I've done what was asked of me. Tick, tick, tick. Don't ask any more. Now, if we're seriously inter interested in human evolution, we're not interested in some sort of insurance policy to protect us against God's demands, which is what right and wrong is. We're interested in what can I do to bring out the powers that are in me. Because as I said to you at the start of this interview, what are we about here in this world? Not theories to help me to live more in a more balanced way with uh, adversity and so forth so that I go to my grave, you know, a recollected person. No, we're interested here in power. And it's not about, you know, soulful ideas of love and good and goodwill towards all things. We are interested in power, because if I have power to dictate the circumstances of my life, to dictate that I am no longer the, uh, you know, the toy of powerful and manipulative people, then a lot of the issues that have plagued humanity, which come basically from fear and unworthiness, which, as I said to you, are historical in human history, then all those will fall away. So the seat of evolution is the acquisition of power. And that is where the whole relevance of these seven planes uh, come in, as I, I explained earlier on. In the film, Ramtha says, you know, how can you sin against God? What do you think he means by how can you sin against God? Well, I think you have to take that in the context that he said, if you know, if we take this analogy of his, that point zero self-reflected, and that produced what you and I are today, spirit, for want of a better term, and we badly need a better term. Well, that's me up there. I have incarnated in seven different planes a multitude of times, and my soul has recorded those adventures. But my only direction when I left that point was to explore the unknown. So anything that I can do here is an exploration of the unknown. So there is no sin in terms of what I do. We will eventually learn that there are certain things, if we do them, that we are infringing what I said earlier, the action-reaction thing. And we've got to learn that. But there's nobody keeping records up there. The records are here and I'm going to have to deal with them. That's far more painful than a record-keeping God up in the skies. So I think uh, anyone who's setting out on the path of enlightenment will be absolutely impeccable in everything that they do. Is it because of fear of damnation? No. Or of the punishment of God? Or because I have sinned and haven't got forgiveness? No, no, no. I mean, these are all excuses that keeps us away from the real problem. The really uh, enlightened person will see every action has a reaction with which I must deal. And if I'm wise, I'm not going to do stuff that will cause me to have to face it and resolve it and balance it in my soul later. That's the real criterion. So you cannot sin against God because there is no sin against God. So how can we perform that action? Because the divine presence is in us all and we are fulfilling the divine mandate in everything that we do, we will find out quickly enough because of the action-reaction reality that there are some things that do not evolve me. And we'll have to learn that sooner or later. But is it, can you sin against God? That's impossible. And it implies an idea of God and God's will for us that belongs to the hamburger universe, that it doesn't belong to reality.